Thanks to the Thomistic Institute and the House of Studies. Um, one of the uh, disadvantages of going uh, last is you've had listened to two other fine papers and had plenty of time to reconsider all the mistakes you've made in your own. So this is all very provisional. So, um, so for Thomas Aquinas, uh, for Thomas Aquinas, uh, contemplation is thought in bliss, and anticipation of the eternal beatitude to which we aspire and hope while now pilgrims, but will one day delight in as comprehensors. As Thomas puts it in the Summa Contra Gentiles, in this life there is nothing so like this ultimate and perfect happiness as the life of those who contemplate the truth as far as possible here below. For contemplation of truth begins in this life, but will be consummated in the life to come. I want eventually to talk about how contemplation fits into Thomas's understanding of the task of theology. But before getting to theology, I want to begin with philosophy, indeed with the philosopher, Aristotle himself. Uh, more specifically, I want to draw upon Jonathan Lear's study, Aristotle, The Desire to Understand, to suggest that the Aristotelian notion of contemplation as a kind of spiritualizing of material substances in which the knower comes to knowledge of both self and God can help us understand Thomas's approach to theology. As Jonathan Lear puts it, for Aristotle, the human person is, by nature, a systematic understander of the world. This will hardly come as news to any reader of Aristotle who understands what it means to say that a human being is a rational animal. It is access to the world in its intelligibility that distinguishes human beings from other sensate beings and characterizes the, the distinctive human mode of acting, a mode of action beyond the mere reproduction and nutrition by which species and individuals are sustained. So confronted by a frog, we do not see it as something with which to mate, as another frog might, nor simply as something to eat, as a raccoon might, but precisely as a frog, something that is what it is because of its essential frogginess which it has in common with all other frogs and which is not reducible to its materiality. We might say that our distinctively human appetite for the frog is an intellectual appetite, a desire to know it, to possess its form intellectually by grasping its essence. This activity of accessing the world as intelligible is what Aristotle calls contemplation or theoria. And in this activity, we simultaneously grasp our own identity as graspers of such intellectual, intelligible structure, as well as the identity of the first mover, that which accounts for the intelligible structure of the world. Now, on Lear's account, it is this human activity of grasping essences that reveals the distinctive role of the rational animal in the world. He notes, when mind comes to understand the essence of flesh, it, as it were, lifts form right out of its material instantiation. Frogginess can exist in a frog only as materially instantiated. In us, however, it can exist immaterially, as a species in the mind. Lear writes, mind contemplating an essence is itself that very essence. It is that essence at the highest level of activity. In the act of knowing, the human mind frees frogginess from material potency so that it exists, as Lear puts it, at its highest level of actuality. Our human contemplation of the world spiritualizes material substances through the process of abstraction. Our knowledge of frogs is their spirituality. Just as a side note, I have a, maybe someday I will construct a, an argument for the uh, immortality of non-rational animals based on this argument of Lear's. Uh, but anyway, uh, if contemplation of things raises their essence to their highest level of actuality, then it seems that being known 
is the telos of living substances. Lear writes, for all natural organisms, the strong desire to survive, to sustain life, flourish, and reproduce is, from another perspective, a striving to become intelligible. What sets human beings apart from other living organisms is that we are, as Lear puts it, capable of appreciating this other perspective. Contemplation not only brings the object contemplated to its highest form of actuality, but it is at the same time the contemplator at his or her highest level of actuality, the thinker perfected as thinker. It is, for the rational animal, the highest form of pleasure. And this highest of pleasures, this bliss, is not only a grasping of essences and of ourselves as knowers of essences, it is a grasping, if only partial, of God. So Lear writes, in coming to understand the world, we become like God. We become godlike. To give some sense of how Aristotle, on Lear's account, connects this knowing of the world, ourselves, and God, Permit, permit me to quote at some length, and this is the first selection on the handout. So it is by the very activity of understanding the world that we come to understand ourselves. So it would seem that the desire to understand leads us toward an activity of thinking that is at once an understanding of the world and understanding of ourselves and an understanding of God. If we are ignorant of the world's relation to God, we do not know why the world is the way it is. But if we must understand the world in order fully to appreciate what is involved in being a systematic understander of it, it would seem that we must understand God and his relation to the world before we can fully understand ourselves. And in coming to understand God, and thus the world, and thus ourselves, we both fulfill our own essence and imitate God. That is why we must paradoxically transcend our own nature in order to realize it. Now, I'm not willing to guarantee that Lear is correct in his presentation of Aristotle. Um, this is not an uncontested reading of Aristotle. Uh, but I would like to claim that what he says about the desire to know is leading to a simultaneous knowing of world, self, and God can cast a helpful light on why Thomas Aquinas does theology in the way that he does, and why theology should be understood as fundamentally a fundamentally contemplative activity that is not divorced from, but indeed illuminates more mundane human intellectual endeavors. So second, I want to look at Thomas on what I call the dynamism of knowing. For Thomas, no less than Aristotle, contemplation of the divine effects also belongs to the contemplative life inasmuch as a person is led by this knowledge to God. That's a quote from, um, from the Secunda Secunda 184. The desire to know essences that is so characteristic of the human animal as a systematic understander finds its ultimate orientation and fulfillment in our knowledge of God. This suggests that the mundane contemplation of ordinary things, like frogs, or I suppose now birds, is for Thomas ordered to contemplation of the divine essence. To see how this is the case, let's look at a much poured over and debated passage near the beginning of the Prima Secunda, uh, question three, article eight, and that's the second selection on your handout. So, to show that human happiness cannot consist in anything other than the vision of God's essence, Thomas says that we must consider two points. First, a human being is not perfectly happy as long as something remains for one to desire and seek. Second, the perfection of any power is judged according to the nature of its object. So perfect happiness, beatitudo, or as I like to say, bliss, is connected with the cessation of our desire, an end to our seeking. And what perfection consists in depends upon the object of the particular power. Sight, whose object is the visible, is perfected by seeing. Touch, whose object is the tactile, is perfected by touching, and so on. 
But what about that most distinctively human power, the power of understanding? Thomas continues, the object of the intellect is quod quid est, what a thing is. That is, the essence of a thing. For this reason, the intellect attains perfection insofar as it knows the essence of a thing. If therefore an intellect knows the essence of some effect by which it is not possible to know the essence of the cause, that is, to know of the cause what it is, that intellect cannot be said to reach that cause in an absolute sense, though it may be able to gather from the effect the knowledge that the cause is. So the object of the intellectual power is the essence of things, and to know the essence of something, we must know its cause. Not simply that it has a cause, but the essence of the cause, since it is by its essence that the cause brings about the effect. To merely know that there is a cause is profoundly unsatisfying. It leaves the intellect unfulfilled and still seeking in its desire. To put it in an Augustinian idiom, it leaves us restless in our desire to know. So Thomas concludes this part of his argument saying, consequently, in knowing an effect and knowing that it has a cause, there naturally remains in a human being the desire to know about the cause what it is. This desire belongs to wondering and causes inquiry as is stated in the beginning of the metaphysics nor does this inquiry cease until he arrives at a knowledge of the essence of the cause. Thus far, we have Thomas on the natural human desire to know the essences of mundane primary substances and how this involves knowing their causes. But what if we shift the register, as Thomas does here in a somewhat sneaky way, from the desire to know the essence and therefore the cause of this or that mundane primary substance to the desire to know the essence of the world of primary substances as a whole? What if, beginning from some mundane effect, we stretch the desire to know to extend across the entire web of effects and causes, such that we desire to know the cause of the world taken, as Peter Geech puts it, as a great big object? If the pattern of desire that holds true in the case of knowledge of individual essences holds true in the case of the world taken as a great big object, then knowledge merely that there is a cause of the world as a whole would leave our desire unquenched and our bliss unattained. So Thomas says, if therefore the human intellect, knowing the essence of some created effect, knows no more of God than that he is, its perfection does not yet reach the first cause in an absolute way, but there remains in it a natural desire to seek the cause. For this reason, it is not yet perfectly happy. Consequently, for perfect happiness, the intellect needs to reach the very essence of the first cause. And so Thomas reaches his conclusion. Thus it will have its perfection through union with God as with that object in which perfect human happiness alone consists, as stated earlier. Now, I've spent a long time on an extremely familiar passage in order to bring out the congruity of Jonathan Lear's account of Aristotle with Thomas's account of what we might call the dynamism of human knowing and its orientation toward knowledge of God as first cause. As with Aristotle, we know ourselves as knowers in the act of knowing the world, since the human intellect, like anything else, is knowable only to the extent that it is actual, and the natural object of the act of knowing is the essence of material things. But our knowledge of the world does not simply give us knowledge of ourselves as knowers. It also launches us on a quest to know the first cause of the world that we know. As Thomas says at the outset of his commentary on John, the height and sublimity of contemplation consists most of all in the contemplation and knowledge of God. I'll just note here, uh, he doesn't say consist exclusively, but consists most of all. If for Thomas, as for Lear's Aristotle, contemplation of God, self, and world are so thoroughly intertwined 
This suggests that it's a bit trickier than it might initially appear to separate out contemplation as a theological topic in Thomas. Indeed, contemplate proves to be a remarkably plastic term in Thomas's hands. At its broadest stretch, it seems more or less equivalent to thinking itself. To contemplate is to think of some thing so as to know its truth. Natural philosophers who study aquatic life or the motion of heavenly bodies lead contemplative lives of a sort. This is not obviously the most perfect form of contemplation, since it is a contemplation of things that are more, as in aquatic life, or less, as in heavenly bodies, mutable, and therefore less intrinsically knowable. But it is truly, as Thomas uses the term, contemplation. What makes a contemplation is not simply the plasticity of the term contemplate, but the fact that the essence of both frogs and planets cannot be fully grasped until one arrives at contemplation of the first cause, without which there would be neither frogs nor planets. And we should note this contemplation of the first cause is not simply the bare knowing that there is a first cause, but knowledge of the divine essence. But this account of Thomas on the mutual implication of mundane and divine contemplation would be incomplete were we not to note that the knowing of contemplation passes over into loving. And uh, Father Andrew, I believe, quoted the same passage from uh, Aquinas. Sometimes in our concern to defend Thomas's intellectualism from the depredations of Scotists and others, we underplay the role of the will in contemplation. But Thomas notes that were our wills not drawn to the good at which the contemplative life aims, we would never embark upon such a, a pursuit. Through loving God, we are aflame to gaze on his beauty, he says. Moreover, the will delights in that good once it has been attained. So Thomas writes, and this is the third selection on the handout, Although the contemplative life consists chiefly in an act of the intellect, it has its beginning in the appetite, since it is uh, through charity that one is urged to the contemplation of God. And since the end corresponds to the beginning, it follows that the term also and the end of the contemplative life has its beginning in the appetite, since one delights in seeing the object loved, and the very delight of the object seen arouses a yet greater love. Therefore, Gregory says that when we see one whom we love, we are so aflame as to love him more. And this is the ultimate perfection of the contemplative life, namely that the divine truth be not only seen but loved. Here it might seem that we have located the point of Thomas's parting of ways with Aristotle. But though he lacks a developed account of the will, something like love of God is not entirely absent in Aristotle. For Aristotle, the first mover moves the world only by the attractive power it exerts. And so the world we contemplate has the character it does because it is driven by an appetite to imitate the first mover, to replicate in itself the intellectual order of God. We rational animals, we systematic knowers, more than any other beings, are moved to know the world out of a desire to imitate God. And both Lear and Thomas think that Aristotle's God is not quite as self-enclosed as is typically claimed. Indeed, there is even a sense in Aristotle of a kind of ecstatic transcendence in which contemplation terminates. As Lear puts it in the passage I quoted earlier, we must paradoxically transcend our own nature in order to realize it. All that stuff at the end of the Nicomachean Ethics that, that modern Aristotelians like to just kind of poo-poo. Lear takes with absolute seriousness and uh, I think ends up with a rather different account of, of Aristotle. Um, where Thomas does differ from Aristotle is in his belief that the phrase love of God can be read as a subjective genitive as well as an objective genitive. That is to say, the God we desire to imitate is one who has loved us first. The God of Christian faith causes mundane actuality not simply by being lovable, but by loving and by willing to call forth a world from nothing. 
Such a thought clearly does not and perhaps cannot enter into Aristotle's understanding of the cosmos. And it is this understanding of God as agent that makes possible an understanding of contemplation is not simply the terminus of the natural desire of humans as systematic understanders, but as the gracious gift bestowed upon us so that knowledge of God does not remain something, as Thomas says at the outset of the Summa, available only to a few and even then after a long time and with the mixing in of many errors. And maybe this might launch us back into the discussion of infused contemplation. But there's another thought that is, it seems, beyond Aristotle's ken. Why does our mundane contemplation so often fail to lead to contemplation of God? Of course, Aristotle does ask that question. But while Aristotle certainly has an account of acrasia, a lack of self-mastery that inhibits virtue, because he doesn't really have a fully developed notion of willing, he likewise lacks an account of that willful wrongdoing that we call sin. To put it briefly, for Thomas, the natural dynamism of the intellect is diverted from its final end not only by the body's passions, as in the case of Aristotelian acrasia, but also by a defective rational appetite, a will that has been wounded by sin. So we are doubly inhibited in what should be our natural passage from contemplation of the world to contemplation of God, inhibited in such a way that we need not, we need not simply self-mastery, but also divine grace, not simply elevating, but also healing. All of this requires a vision of God, self, and world in which God's act of love has priority. And this seems clearly a thought Aristotle could not think. So at this point, you might be wondering if the theologian's ever going to get to theology. Um, well, the time has come. With all that I've said thus far as background, I'd like in the remainder of my remarks to say something about the place of contemplation in Thomas's understanding of theology. So Thomas famously claims that sacra doctrina, holy teaching, is an enterprise that is both speculative and practical but primarily speculative. And in the Summa Theologiae, he gives us a model of what this looks like, in which the practical inquiries of the secunda pars are framed by and enfolded in the speculative explorations of the prima pars and the tertia pars. But we should not think that Thomas means by speculative what we might think. He certainly does not mean spinning out theories about God as personal reveries. What Thomas intends by characterizing holy teaching as speculative is to highlight the contemplative nature of the undertaking. And the particular nature of theology for Thomas is determined by his understanding of the nature of contemplation is having its beginning in God's effects, those mundane things that we desire to understand. In asking the question of whether theology is scientia, one of the arguments Thomas addresses is the one that says that scientia is not of particular things, whereas holy teaching deals with particular facts, quote, such as the deeds of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the like. Theology would be, it seems, what Thomas calls in his sentences commentary, a narrative of signs and examples, which suggests that it is not a science, and certainly not a speculative science. But, Thomas responds, the particular facts concerning Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so forth are not, in fact, the principal concern of theology. These are included either as recounting miraculous events that point us toward the truth of revelation or as moral examples for us to follow, since practical reasoning needs examples. They are, in other words, instrumental directing us toward a truth that exceeds the time-bound narrative of signs and examples, a truth that is nothing less than the timeless essence of God. Thomas speaks of how theology makes use of God's effects, either of nature or of grace. Everybody, you know, when they, you read the five ways and you get down that your you know, natural knowledge of God is based on God's effects, well, grace knowledge of God is also based on God's effects. Uh, so as to move from the effects to the cause. 
In this way, the narrative of divine revelation witnessed to in scripture is, like the natural order itself, a created effect that should point us to God as first cause. We can see how this works in considering what Thomas has to say about the most perfect of all created effects, the sacred humanity of Christ. For as the most actual of God's created effects, it must therefore be most, it must therefore most clearly point us to the divine essence. In considering devotion, which is the chief act of the virtue of religion, Thomas addresses the question of whether contemplation causes devotion. One of the arguments against the thesis is that if contemplation were the cause of devotion, then the higher object of contemplation, that is the divine essence, would cause greater devotion. But in fact, it seems that it is often contemplation of the humanity of Christ that causes the greatest devotion. So the argument concludes, something else must be causing devotion. Uh, Thomas replies, and this is the fourth selection on the handout, Matters concerning the divinity are in themselves the strongest incentive to love and consequently to devotion, because God is supremely lovable. Yet such is the weakness of the human mind that it needs a guiding hand, not only to the knowledge, but also to the love of divine things by means of certain sensible objects known to us. Chief among these is the humanity of Christ, according to the words of the preface, that is from the, uh, from the liturgy of the mass, that through knowing God visibly, we may be caught up to the love of things invisible. Therefore, matters relating to Christ's humanity are the chief incentive to devotion, leading us there like a guiding hand, although devotion itself has for its object matters concerning the Godhead. We see here not only the integral role played by elevating and healing grace in Thomas's account of contemplation, but also the Christological character of that grace. For it is through the humanity of Christ as narrative sign that we encounter the preeminent effects of God, by, by which is affected, the, excuse me, the preeminent effect of God, by which is affected through the gift of faith, the passage from visible to invisible. Even in the case of Christ's humanity, it is only through abstracting from the particular created effect that one arrives at the invisible divine essence. This movement from the visible to the invisible, from humanity to divinity, is seen in Thomas's discussion of the scene in John's Gospel, where Thomas the Apostle encounters the risen Christ. Uh, Aquinas draws upon Gregory the Great's sermon on that scene, especially doubting Thomas's profession of my Lord and my God, in which Gregory brings out the seeming disjunction between what Thomas's senses see and what his lips profess. He apprehended a mere man and testified that this was the invisible God. That's from homily 26 of Gregory the Great. Aquinas in his own commentary writes, it seems that Thomas quickly became a good theologian by professing a true faith. He professed the humanity of Christ when he said, my Lord, and he professed the divinity of Christ when he said, and my God. Thomas saw one thing and believed another. He saw the man and the wounds, and from these he believed in the divinity of the one who had arisen. It seems that what it means for Thomas to be a good theologian is to be able to pass from knowing Christ after the flesh to being caught up in the love of the invisible divine essence that he shares with the Father and the Spirit. I'd like to suggest that what is going on in becoming a good theologian is something analogous, not identical, but analogous to what the marine biologist must do to be a good scientist. If theology is, as Anselm describes it, fides querens intellectum, then what seeking understanding involves is something like a process of abstraction by which we move from the particular frog to its essential frogginess. To recount the narrative of God's dealings with the world through Israel, Jesus, and the church, as important as that is, is not yet to be doing theology. 
sometimes worry that my professors at Yale are spinning in their graves as I say that, but I think they would agree with me. Like the marine biologists seeking to grasp the intelligible structure of a frog's frogginess, the theologian seeks to gra grasp the intelligible structure of that narrative. And this intelligible structure is what I believe Thomas means by conveniencia or fittingness. This too is an, active, uh, an activity of the systematic understander. For the narrative of signs and examples is not merely perceived, but is to be grasped. There, and this requires the labor of contemplation by which the facts of salvation history are as it were spiritualized and are seeking to know them, raised to a higher level of actuality by being grasped by the intellect. So for Thomas, Contemplation is not a code word for a kind of mushy mysticism in which thought plays no role. Nor is it, and we can probably discuss this because I'm not, I, I suspect people will not all agree with this, nor is it solely a non-discursive beholding of God's essence. Rather, as Thomas notes in his commentary on the ethics, contemplation includes both investigation to attain the truth and reflection on the truth already attained. It's both hunting for the birds and looking at the birds. And while the latter is the superior activity, since it is the end toward which investigation is ordered, the hard intellectual work of seeking the truth is no less truly contemplative. Making the same point somewhat more expansively in the Summa Theologiae, Thomas writes, and this is the fifth selection, the contemplative life has one act, wherein it is finally completed, namely the contemplation of truth. And from this act, it derives its unity. Yet it has many acts whereby it arrives at this final act. Some of these pertain to the reception of principles from which it proceeds to the contemplation of truth. Others are concerned with deducing from the principles, the truth, the knowledge of which is sought. And the last and crowning act is the contemplation itself of the truth. This is a passage we've already been discussing. So to contemplate the mysteries of faith is to apply the mind to them, to approach them as the systematic understander that we are by nature, by discerning principles and deducing conclusions until we arrive at the point where, Thomas says, discoursing must be laid aside and the soul's gaze fixed upon the contemplation of one simple truth. This is the first movement of theology. While contemplation of one simple truth may be the crowning act of our inquiry, it's not the last act. There is a second act that follows, for the theological task terminates in sharing with others the fruits of contemplation, a process that might be thought of as the contemplative path run in reverse. For the theologian, fired by love of the divine essence, the discernment of principles and deducing of conclusions that have led to that one simple truth are put on orderly display so that others might share in that knowledge and love. Thomas is well known for saying that when theologians are instructing an audience and quote, helping them understand the truth they already believe, reason should be used to get to the heart of the truth enable them to know just how it is true. He goes on to say, if we determine a theological question by sheer appeal to authority without argumentation, we may inform people of the truth, but we, quote, leave them with an empty head. Um, actually, I think the Latin just says we leave them empty, but it always gets translated as with an empty head, which, since we all know people with empty heads, so it's, I kind of like that. The ministry of the teacher is to fill the head of the student with his or her own discursive path as a systematic understander of the scriptural narrative of signs and examples, now bathed in the light of the teacher's own contemplation of the one simple truth that is the divine essence. Jonathan Lear notes something analogous in seeking to grasp the fruits of Aristotle's contemplation. He writes, we have come to understand his world his being Aristotle, by working through the very problems and thoughts Aristotle did. Thus, our understanding of Aristotle is to some extent a reenactment of his thinking. We who study Thomas Aquinas can likewise say that as we work through the same problems and thoughts that he did, we seek to reenact his thinking 
so that we might catch a glimpse of the one for love of whom Thomas studied, watched, labored, preached, and taught. Through the many questions and articles of the Summa Theologiae, through the textual divisions and intellectual siftings of the scripture commentaries, even through the tediously detailed commentaries on Aristotle, Thomas continues to share with us the fruits of his contemplation. It seems appropriate that the Ambrosian liturgy in the Eucharistic preface appointed for his feast day should praise Thomas with these words. He turned his back on wealth and honors and opened his heart to the light of your word, aspiring to teach with clarity and insight what he had received in loving contemplation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bowerschmidt, uh, for an excellent talk. I know that we have a first question, which we'll take um, from Zoom from uh, Dr. Kevin Hart. So Dr. Hart, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me, Fritz? Yeah. Good. Yes. Nice to see you after all these years. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I just have one question, a, a curiosity. You talk a good deal about frogs. Other people have spoken about birds. Of course, in the tradition, it's birds that are associated with contemplation, not frogs. I'm thinking in particular of Richard of St. Victor, where he explicitly identifies the movements of the birds in the air with the movements of contempl contemplatio. But what I had in mind is something that you talked about in passing, that other people also have spoken about in passing, which is the way in which a contemplation of, let's say, a bird or a frog is ordered ultimately to the, um, to the contemplation of God and how that is impeded by various things, let's call them sin, to, to be brief. Now, all, all of this is, is um, good Aquinas, of course. When Aquinas talks about Richard on this, he explicitly, maybe that's the wrong word, he leaves out the modes of contemplation that Richard explicitly puts in place, of dilatio mentis, sublevatio mentis, excessus mentis, whereby we can contemplate anything, be it ever so humble, and this gives us some kind of insight into, into the divine life. So I wonder if you have any comment as to why Aquinas might have not made any comment on those on those modes. Mm. Well, that's interesting. So, so first on birds, I would I thought what I thought you were going to bring up was the fact that at the beginning of the commentary on John, he's got a sort of extended reverie on the fact that John is symbolized by the eagle and how the eagle right. is, um, you know, the the kind of the contemplative par excellence because it sees from a distance and 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 all of this. Um, uh, and maybe I could have spun this as the difference between frogs and birds, as the difference between Thomas and Aristotle, I don't know. But um, to, to your question, and I, I probably would need to think about this, uh, you know, in, in, a, in, more, in more depth. But uh, during the last break, I was actually saying to Michael, Michael Gorman that I, I asked him whether he thought that Aquinas's um, terminological flexibility, as he put it, was, was a bug or a feature. Right? I mean, is, is, is Thomas just sometimes sloppy, or is he sometimes uh, deliberately not making distinctions that maybe others have made? And it seems to me, in some ways, you're asking, why does he not use this handy set of distinctions that Richard uses? And because Thomas is so brilliant in making distinctions, I think we sometimes don't pay attention to when he's not making distinctions. Um, and I think... Uh, I at least like to read him as, as being as deliberate in not making distinctions as he is in making distinctions. I mean, sure, sometimes he's just overlooking things and, you know, uh, maybe making, making a mistake uh, or leaving something unclarified that could helpfully be clarified. But I'm just wondering in this, in this case, and I'd have to go back and look at the actual text of Richard uh, to, to know, but, but I'm wondering if there might have been something in these distinctions that Richard makes that he, he does find unhelpful. Whether it, I mean, I've tried to present Thomas as having a very, very unified notion of 
of contemplation, um, right? So that, it's, as I said, the term has a certain plasticity that can really stretch across all sorts of, of thinking. And I mean, maybe he thought those kinds of distinctions uh, somehow inhibited the plasticity of the term and that that was, and, and, and Aquinas prized the plasticity of the term more than the, the various distinctions you can make. That's, I'd have to go back and look at what Richard does with those distinctions though, to, to say that with any more you know, uh, certainty. So, do you have a theory of why he might have omitted it? The, the best I can come up with is that um, Thomas is awfully keen, following Gregory in the Moralia, uh, to, to hasten us to the contempla contemplation of God in, in an almost single-minded way. So he doesn't want stops along, along the way. Whereas Richard seems, with the doctrine of the modes, to allow us to linger in the created world and to contemplate things which are in the created world. And Aquinas may well think that this is just slowing us down. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we have a question from one of our uh, viewers from Zoom, Gilmar Sequera. So I'll read the question to you. Is there any relation between the object of the intellect, knowing the essence of the thing, and the concept of inscaped, inscape uh, from Father Gerard Manley Hopkins? I mean, the, the facile answer is, oh, well, Hopkins is a SCOTist, so clearly not. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I, th I think I would just have to say that I, that I, that I don't, I'm not sure I know. Um, I'm not, I, I don't think I have an answer. Do we have a, a volunteer to answer? Yeah. Zena Hitz looked like she maybe wanted to say something, but now she's saying no. Uh, so she's going to punt on that. All right, another question. This is from Noah Lett. Not just known, but loved. If love here is willing the good of another, what good am I willing when contemplating anything or when contemplating God? What good are you willing? Well, I would, I mean, I would say you, you might be willing a number of goods that are, that bear a particular order to each other. I mean, in some ways you're willing your own good as a knower, right? The, the actualization of your, of your essence as a, as a knower. But I mean, clearly in a sense, you're, you're also willing the good that is God, right? Um, and you, in a sense, grasp your own, the good, the goodness of your, uh, of your essence as a knower, you grasp it more firmly once you realize that it can terminate in not just in knowledge of frogs, but knowledge of God. So, uh, Father Corbett looked like he had a just, comment. Uh, just a comment that uh, I was reminded of Joseph Pieper's book about love where he describes it as giving approval. It's good that you exist. It's, yeah. it's not necessarily willing a good in addition to what's before you. It can simply be an act of approving of what is in in. Uh, right before you. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's a helpful distinction. I mean, you can talk about willing a good in, a, in the sense of, I mean, well, you can think about the word, well, the Latin, benevolence, right? I mean, benevolence can mean active doing of good, but I think it can also simply mean uh, the will's uh, kind of accession to the being of, of the beloved, so. We have a question from Zena Hitz. Yes, I, I wanted to ask about um, the use of Lear's work in comparison with Aquinas. And I think it's also a way of getting back to Dr. Hart's question. Um, I wonder whether, I don't remember the details of Lear's interpretation, but it's at least standard common interpretation, if not the only one. Um, that God acts as a cause, uh, as a final cause. That is, other the, the the things in the world act for the sake of Him in His activity. So He's He's not necessarily a creator. On the one hand, on the other hand, uh, it may be that when we grasp the essence of something say the frog, we grasp a froggy essence, um, 
we're grasping the essence that is in the mind of God. That is, there's not necessarily a gap between our grasp of an essence of a frog and God's grasp of an essence of a frog. Um, especially if the, the, the student of nature in question has done the metaphysics and knows that uh, all living things in some way act for the sake of God. So I wonder if that there's a there's a greater accessibility of Aristotle's God to the ordinary knower um, that um, might complicate the connection to Aquinas and and might also make natural science more interesting and fruitful than it would be for Aquinas for whom God has much more going on. Uh, than that, he's a creator and he um, grasps the causes of things in a way that we don't have access to, I think. Uh, anyway, I, yeah. some comments on that would be helpful. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, there's, there's, boy, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot that, that could be said. I mean, one, well, one thing to say is that, um, uh, as I, as I made a mention in passing in the, in the, in the paper, Lear and Thomas are, are kind of a minority report in terms of God's knowledge of the of essences, right? Um, they, they do it somewhat differently. I mean, Thomas says, well, Aristotle might not think that God knows created essences, but he should think that God knows created essences and then gives his argument. And, and uh, Lear kind of fudges on the term no, uh, but sort of basically says, well, created, created essences are what they are because they are imitating God, and therefore God in knowing himself can be said to know those essences. Um, but on, on this question of accessibility, that's, it's really pretty interesting. So if God is, and I think this is, I think this is true, God is for Aristotle only a final cause, um, uh, or maybe some kind of exemplar cause, but certainly not an efficient cause. Um, uh, I, the way I try and explain it to students is, you know that, um, uh, you know that person you fell in love with your freshman year and you kind of joined all the clubs that they belong to and, and you arranged your dining hours so you could be in the dining hall at the same time and you, know, you arranged to bump into them on the path and they were totally controlling all your emotions and they did not know you existed. Right, so <laughs> it was only your desire for them that was was moving you. Right, um, uh, so I think that's that's true. So for Aquinas, what would be different is that God, in addition to being a final cause, is the efficient cause of the world, and and this is this is um, a free act on the part of God. So again, we've got this notion of will. Right, so God freely creates the world. Right, Thomas, you know, against various Arabic Aristotelians, you know, Thomas wants to really, you know underscore that point. And I think because the creation of the, the material world that we know is rooted in the will of God, I think it probably does have a kind of a opacity that it doesn't have in Aristotle. Um, uh, that, that, that somehow, I mean, even something like uh, the existence of the creation of the world in time for, for Aquinas is simply a revealed datum. Right, um, we can't even that fundamental a question about nature because creation is rooted in the divine will. We can't get beyond the data of revelation on that question to come up with a rational answer. So I think, um, I mean, I think you're right. I think there is the for Aristotle, the world is more knowable because God is only the final cause and not the efficient cause. So that's a great question. You made me do a lot of thinking up here. <laughs> Well, we now have another question from one of our uh, students through Zoom, Catherine Stockel from Texas A&M. Go ahead. Thank you, Father Fondman. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering what uh, Aquinas' discussion of contemplation could offer to the 17th century philosopher's discussion um, of body and soul interactions like Descartes' theory of imagination or Cavendish's idea of Christ or Mary Estelle's plastical, effectible, effective powers of the soul. Um, how do you think we could you could help um, link the body and soul relation through this discussion of contemplation. Um, yeah, I mean, in some ways, it, it, it seems like, you know, Aristotle is, I mean, not Aristotle, Descartes is operating in such a different universe than, than Aquinas, you know. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I feel like Descartes has, I mean, Aquinas just sort of presumes this in a way 
I guess it's safe to say he presumes this unity of, of body and, and soul, of form and matter, uh, that, that Descartes is you know, going to call into question from the outset, right? And so, um, uh, I mean, there's a part of me that wants to say, yeah, Aquinas could fix everything that's wrong with the 17th century. <laughs> um, but I also have this um, intuition uh, that I'm actually hoping to pursue in the next couple of years, that there are things going on in the 17th century that simply were not on Aquinas's plate. You know, certain developments in natural sciences. Um, uh, and, you know, um, I guess certain philosophical movements, um, uh, even certain new sort of political forms that, that just weren't on Aquinas's plate that might make us more sympathetic to what 17th century thinkers are doing. So I, I don't want to say that you could just, and this is sort of the attorney Patris uh, approach, you can just bring in Aquinas to fix everything that's wrong with modern philosophy. Um, I, that, my intuition tells me, as much as I love Thomas, that that's not quite right. Um, so I think, uh, but that doesn't mean that Thomas has nothing to offer. And it might be, what I always tell my undergraduates is the best thing about studying the Middle Ages is it can make you think that things that go without saying in the modern world don't have to go without saying, right? And I, I think Aquinas can, can make us question things like, you know, should we uh, accept sort of the Cartesian account of, of mind and body as setting the terms of the debate, you know, knowing that it, that it hasn't always? I don't know if that really answers your question, but uh, um, if you ask me again in a couple of years, I might have more to say, because I am going to work on the 17th century next. <laughs>